Hello everyone and welcome to a tutorial on how to set up voice chat with your multiplayer game. This video is sponsored by Agora and we'll be using their free SDK to set up spatial voice chat with Pun2. This is building off of the FPS tutorial series, but any Photon project will work. The first thing we need to do is import Agora into our project. So let's go to the Unity Asset Store at assetstore.unity.com and search for Agora Voice SDK. Then we can click Add to My Assets and then open it in Unity. It'll open up the Package Manager, which you can also open by going to Window and then Package Manager. If we select My Assets, we can find the Agora Voice SDK in the list. Next, click Download, and then once it's done finishing for you, click Import to add it to our project. We're going to include the demos for testing purposes. Alright, now let's click Import and wait for it to finish adding all the files to our project. Now that it's finished importing, let's open up the demo scene. On the game controller we'll find the demo script, and there's an app ID field that we need to fill in. It's similar to how Pun works where you just have one app ID for your entire project. So to get our own app ID, let's go to agora.io and choose get started. Then I'm going to sign up for a free account. Once I've verified my email address, I'll just fill in some basic information and we can get started. Okay, and now I'll just log in with the email and password I just created. Now we're in the Agora console. We can close out of the tutorial, because you're already watching one. In the projects area, let's click more and then create. For this tutorial, we're going to be using the testing mode. If you want, you can set up your own token server and handle authentication like that, but that's beyond the scope of this tutorial. You can set the project name to anything you want, and then we'll click submit. Then we'll have to wait a few minutes for Agora to set up a project for us. After two minutes or so, reload the page and it should be ready. Let's click this eyeball to copy our app ID, and then on our game controller, we'll paste it into the app ID slot. Then if we run the game, we can try joining a test channel. Alright, it says that we connected, and then we're getting stats about our channel information every few seconds. Let's leave the channel, and then we can end the game. Now that we've confirmed that our app ID is working, we can start working on a spatial audio solution. So let's first go to the main menu and create a new empty object. Then we'll name it Voice Chat Manager. On it, we'll add a new script called Voice Chat Manager. Let's delete all the default stuff. And then we're going to add a string app ID. And we're just going to set that to the app ID that we just copied from our Agora console. Next, we're going to make this class into a singleton so that there's only ever one of it in the scene. So we'll write public static voice chat manager instance. And then in awake, if there is an instance already, then we'll destroy this. Otherwise, we'll set this object to the instance, and then we'll make sure that it's not destroyed when the scene changes. Let's write using agora underscore gaming underscore RTC at the top so that we can use the Agora SDK. Next, we'll need to create a variable to store a reference to our RTC engine, which will handle voice chat. So let's write I RTC engine, and then we'll just name it RTC engine. In our start method, we'll initialize the RTC engine by setting it to irtcengine.getEngine engine and we'll pass in our app ID. Now let's set up our callbacks. RTC engine.onjoin channel success and we'll add a new method to it called onjoin channel success and I'll just use Visual Studio to generate a template here. But you can just type the same thing. In onjoin channel success, we're just going to debug.log when we join a channel, and then we'll paste the channel name in there. Then we'll do the same thing for on leave channel. Then we'll write debug.log left channel with duration, and then we can add on the stats.duration just so we can see that statistic. Then we'll subscribe to the on-air callback so that whenever we encounter an air with Agora, we'll know. 
Same thing as with the other two, but here we'll debug.log air and we'll say air with Agora and then we'll add on the message. Now that we have all the prerequisites set up, we can start implementing Photon. At the top we'll write using photon.pun and then we'll make sure that this class derives from monobehavior pun callbacks so that we'll get callbacks when we join a room and leave a room. Now if we go down to the bottom we can set up our photon callbacks, public override void on joined room, and public override void on left room. These methods will get called by photon whenever we join a room and whenever we leave a room. So in the onjoined room method, let's say rccengine.joinchannel, and then we'll pass in photonnetwork.currentroom.name. So whenever we join a room, we'll join the voice channel associated with it. Then in on left room, we'll say rccengine.leavechannel. So when we leave a room, we'll leave the voice channel associated with it. And lastly, in on destroy, we'll say irtcengine.destroy, so that whenever the game ends, we make sure to shut down the voice chat service. And that's all we need to try it out. Let's run the game in Unity to make sure our callbacks are firing. If we join a room, it should show that we joined a channel and say the name of our room. Alright, that seems to be working. Let's build the game so that we can test between two clients. Okay, okay, it's, it's being, being a little, a little weird, weird since I have two instances, instances open, open at once, but you should be able to hear my voice coming, coming through the game. The game. And if, if I, start I start the room, the room you can hear, hear that, that um, the, um, voice the voice is still is being still transmitted. transmitted. If I wanted, if I wanted to, check to check the audio, audio on just, just one, one of the, the windows, windows, I can do, do open, open volume, volume mixer, mixer, find the find FPS game, and just turn that all the way down. And now I only have the sound output from the Unity editor. I'll turn that back up. If you're unable to hear your own audio, you can right-click the volume icon, choose Open Sound Settings, and then verify that your default input and output devices are the ones that you want to be listening to and inputting audio to. So with that done, the next step is to implement spatial audio, so I can hear where they are in the scene, and if I move around, you know, the volume will decrease or raise depending on how close I am to them, and it will come out of my right or left ear, depending on which direction I'm facing. Okay, let's go back to the Unity Editor and start working on spatial audio. Let's open up our player controller prefab and add a new script to it called Spatial Audio. We can delete all the default Unity stuff here and let's add a new serialized field float radius. We'll also add a photon view PV so that we can store a reference to the local photon view. And in awake, we'll say PV equals git component photon view to assign it. The way that Agora and Photon handle players is different. In Photon, we have the player class, which lets us check who owns it, get their nickname, and other features. Agora uses a single UIN, which corresponds to the identification number of the player. In order to access a player's Agora ID from their Photon player class, we can use custom properties. At the top of our voice chat manager scripts, we need to add using photon.pun and also using hash table equals exitgames.client.photon.hashtable so that we specify we want to use photon's hash table and not the default C-sharp one. Next, in the onjoin channel success function, we'll create a new hash table and add the value agora ID to it with the uin. We need to convert it to a string because normally photon can't sync uins. Then, we say photon network .set player custom properties and pass in the hash table we just created to assign the custom properties to our local player. Now that we have a way to get a player's Agora ID via their photon player, we can start working on the spatial audio. Let's add an update function and put if not pv.isMine return at the top to make sure that this code only runs on the local player. Here, we're going to loop through all the players in the room and adjust their audio according to the distance between us and our direction. We'll say for each player, and then we have to add using photon.realtime at the top so we can access the player class. For each player, player in photon network .current room .players values. And then this is where we'll do the adjustment. If player.isLocal, so for the local player, we can just continue and skip this loop because we don't need to adjust audio for ourselves. Okay, so I mentioned we're going to have to adjust the audio based on the distance between us and the other player, as well as our direction, but we don't have any way to get that other player's position. Right now, all we have is a reference to their Photon player class, which gives us information about who owns it and their custom properties and stuff, but it doesn't give us any information on their physical whereabouts. To get that information, we'll have to create our own system. 
Let's make a static dictionary with a key of the type player and a value of the type spatial audio. And we'll call this spatial audio from players. Let's also initialize it to an empty dictionary of the same type. In awake, we'll set the key of pv.owner to this, which refers to this spatial audio instance. Then in onDestroy, we'll remove the value with the key of our owner. Let's break this down a little bit. Since the dictionary is static, it'll be shared between all instances of the class spatial audio, which means it'll be the same dictionary on each class, even if the spatial audio scripts are on different players. Because we add this spatial audio in awake and then remove it on onDestroy, this dictionary will hold a reference to all the spatial audio scripts corresponding to the player that controls them. So back to our for each loop, let's say spatial audio other equals spatial audio from players, and then we'll pass in the player that we're looping through. So now locally, we're storing a reference to the spatial audio of that player. Then we can do stuff like getting the distance between us and checking our direction. Let's make two new functions to assist us with this. We'll make a float get gain and a float get pan. Let's work on get gain first. This will take in a vector three of the position of the other player and return a float for the volume we want to set them to. First, we'll get the distance between us by saying float distance equals vector 3 distance, and then we'll pass in our position and the other position. Next, we'll calculate volume gain by using the formula mathf.max of 1 minus the distance divided by the radius, and then 0, times 100f. And this is a little confusing, so I'll cover it for a second. So I've set up a little diagram here. This outside dashed line is the radius of where we can hear players. It's the radius that we set in our spatial audio script. And once you leave this radius, you shouldn't be able to hear players anymore, and they gradually get louder the closer you get to the center. So we're using the formula 1 minus distance divided by radius times 100. We just got the distance, so let's pass it into the formula. Here we have the distance in the formula. As you can see, if I get farther away, the distance gets higher. If I get closer to the player, then the distance gets smaller, and it's zero when we're inside of them. So let's first divide it by 5. So now that I'm on the exact edge of the circle, when my distance is 5, since the radius is 5, we'll get 1 for that value. And as we get closer, it'll get closer and closer to 0. As we get farther, it'll get bigger and bigger. So we want the volume to be louder when we're closer to the player, not quieter. And right now it's getting quieter the closer we go to the player. So we take 1 minus that value, and it's going to invert it. And now when we're at the edge of the circle, our volume is zero, and it gets negative the further out we go. And when we get closer to the player, our volume gradually increases until it reaches one. Then we just have to multiply this by 100 to get our volume gain. So when I get inside of the other player, my volume will be the highest possible, which is 100. And the farther away I get, the smaller the volume gets until I leave the circle, and then it goes negative. And that's what the mathf.max is for. It always keeps the value above or equal to zero, so we don't ever go negative. Now that we've finished calculating the gain, we can just return it. Get pan will also take a vector 3 other position, and will return a value between negative 1 and 1, which will tell us which side of our speakers will receive the most volume. To get the direction between us and the other player, we'll subtract our own position from their position. Then we'll normalize it to get a vector 3 with the magnitude of 1. Once we have the direction, we can use vector 3 dot dot between our transform dot right axis and the direction to get a dot product, and then return that. Covering exactly how the dot product works is beyond the scope of this video, but all you need to know is that it will return a value between negative 1 and 1 depending on two vectors. In this case, our forward vector and the direction to the other player. In this diagram, the center circle is us, and the one moving around is a talking player. If the talking player is directly in front of us, the dot product will be 0, and the speaker volume will be even. If the talking player is to the right, the left speaker will be silent and the right speaker will be at full volume. The same goes for behind and to the left. Now back in our for each loop, we can start calculating the volume. We'll say float gain equals get gain, and we'll pass in the other dot transform dot position. Float pan equals get pan, and we'll pass in other dot transform dot position as well. In order to set the volume and pan for a user, we'll need to get their Agora ID. Thankfully, earlier we set the player's Agora ID in their custom properties, so we can access it here using their player reference. Since there's a bit of a delay between when a player joins a room and when their custom properties are updated, we'll need to wrap this in an if statement, because we don't know for sure if they'll have an Agora ID set up yet. So we'll say if player dot custom properties dot try get value, and then we'll pass in a key of Agora ID and an out object Agora ID, and then we can 
put all of our code that we just created into this if statement. Now that we have the player's Agora ID, we can set their gain and pan using the Agora Audio Effect Manager. Let's go to the top and add an I Audio Effect Manager variable. We'll need to add using Agora underscore gaming underscore RTC at the top to access it. Let's just name our new variable Agora Audio Effects. We can get a reference to the Audio Effect Manager from the RTC engine in the Voice Chat Manager class. In the voice chat manager script, let's make a new method to get the RTC engine. Public IRTC engine get RTC engine, and we'll just return the RTC engine with it. Then, back in our spatial audio script, we can say Agora Audio Effects equals voice chat manager dot instance dot get RTC engine dot get audio effect manager. Now back in our for loop, let's write Agora Audio Effects dot set remote voice position. And since our Agora ID was uploaded as a string, we'll need to parse it into a uint. And since custom properties are stored as objects, we'll need to cast it to a string first. Next, we'll pass in our pan and then gain. And as a final step, we'll have to go into our voice chat manager script, and after all of our callbacks, we'll say RTC engine dot enable sound position indication true. Let's go to our player controller prefab and on the spatial audio script set the radius to 5. You can increase this later if you want. Now let's test it. We'll build the game so that we can test it between two clients. So now that the audio is from the perspective of the Unity editor, so if I move away closer, the volume goes up. And if I turn my head, you can see that, <laughs> I mean, you can hear that the pan is working properly. So if I'm talking here, then it comes out of my left ear, here's it behind me, here's it to my right, then straight in front of me. We got a few errors in the console, some when the players joined and some when the game ended. So let's go and fix these. The first one is a key not found exception on this line, which means that the spatial audio for the player that we're looping through hasn't been added to the dictionary yet. It's because after we set the custom properties, there's still a small delay until we instantiate the player. To fix this, we can just wrap our code in an if statement, checking if the key is present. And if the key isn't present, we should just set their volume to zero so that they're not blasting at full volume. The second error is a null exception, and it's caused because we're trying to access the photon view in the onDestroy method. OnDestroy is called when the game object is being destroyed, so the photon view has already been destroyed by the time we're trying to access it. To fix this, we'll remove the item from the dictionary using the value of this spatial audio script rather than the key of the player. We can use link to make this process easier. Let's add using system.link at the top. In onDestroy, we'll say for each var item in spatial audio from players dot where, and then we'll use a conditional expression and say x equal sign greater than sign x dot value equals equals this and then dot to list to let us modify the dictionary while looping. So here we're using a link expression where to get a new list of all the key value pairs in this dictionary that match the requirement of their value being this spatial audio script. Then we can just say spatial audio from players dot remove and pass in item dot key. And that's it for this video. Thank you all so much for watching. I invited a bunch of people from my Discord server to play and test out the voice chat with me, and we all had a great time doing it. There's like, like a stack of like three people on the box. <laughs> <laughs> like one guy stand on box, the box head. Box people. Uh, I've been oh, trying okay. to do. I'm in I'm trying on. to. And then right yeah, have one guy stand <laughs> on another guy's head. We're gonna make a stare. Exactly. I am the chair. <laughs> Here I'll. Hello everyone and welcome back to the multiplayer. Oh, no, 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 don't do that. Today I want to put some don't look at it, on our don't look at it. and <laughs> also let the player set their own yeah. play. Canvas, which means it displays uh, on the entire screen. It. I can't stand it. Hey guys, welcome to the first oh! All right, I'm gonna Did anyone a order a cheeseburger with fries? I want two number nines, and number ten, and two number eleven. I had originally planned like a battle or something, but we ended up just hanging out and talking to each other. It was a lot of fun. As always, thank you to my Patreon supporters, fellow individual, Big 3D, Sevagon, Mendes, PGM Brew, Crazy Potato, Gary, Louie, 
Neil, Professor DJ, Twisted Sights, CKVFX, Dottie, Ghost Boy, Joel, Lambda, 90, Sam, William, and XZPZACX. Thank you all so much.